Greetings. Welcome to a discussion on the Ten Commandments as a political theology. My name is Pete Radowski and I am going to be the presenter on this, on this discussion. I would like to begin by sharing with you the origin of this discussion. This past Christmas my wife gave me a commentary on the book of Deuteronomy. I read it and as I think about that commentary and the very good things the author had to say, I remember one sentence above everything else with great clarity. Namely, Deuteronomy is a political theology. Now, I had never heard that before. So I began to wonder, was it there some back someplace back in my mind, so I went back to my Sunday school days, my confirmation days, retreats for uh, teenagers in the church. I even tried to remember some sermons. Never heard that Deuteronomy or the Bible or any part of the Bible was a political theology. And then I remembered what I was really taught in Sunday school, what I was really taught by my teachers and my youth advisor was the Bible was written for individuals. It was writtenly, written personally for an individual like me. So every time I read a biblical text about how Jesus loves me and Jesus died for me, and how Jesus cares for me, and how Jesus forgives me, I was to understand that text as being written for me. And every time I read a text that talked about sin, or places that people screw up, that text was written strictly for me. And in a belief system where the Bible is written for individuals, primarily, if not solely, there is no room for politics or political theology. Then I went to seminary. And believe it or not, the seminary professors had a different take on the original audience for the Bible. The seminary professors taught me the Bible's original audience was God's collective people, Israel, and the church. They reminded us that the Protestant Bible has 66 books. 62 of them were written either to Israel, to a synagogue, to congregations of the first two centuries, or to the emerging worldwide church. Even in those four books where individuals are addressed and they are the recipients of the letter, there is a great deal of writing about what God's collective people are to do and are to be. And so I left seminary believing the Bible's original audience was not individuals, but a collective group. But even in that thinking system, I never connected politics or a political theology to all of my studies. Then there is this text, Deuteronomy is a political theology. After reading that text, I decided I had used politics and, uh, and uh, political discussions all my life but I better go look it up to see what it was like. And this is what I learned from Wikipedia. Politics is the set of activities that are associated with decision-making in groups or other forms of power relationships between individuals, such as the distribution of resources. I then went and tried to see this definition through biblical eyes. And I began to raise these kinds of issues. Whenever God's people 
began the debate of who should have authority to be God's leaders. Who should have the authority to be a guide to say this is where we're going and this is what we're going to do. Who shall we appoint or follow or lead? And when you do that, that's a political discussion. Or I ask the question, when God's people begin the process of deciding, how do we make decisions? Is that a political discussion? I mean, after all, when we ask the question, do we make decisions through an autocratic group where one or two or a small group of people can say, this is what we're going to do, this is what we've decided, and the rest of us stand up and say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am? Or when we begin to talk about making decisions as a majority, is it 51% plus one that rules? Or do we make decisions by consensus, knowing that in consensus, every individual has the veto power over the whole group. Who is to lead God's people and how are we to make decisions are political questions. And then there is the question God's people raise all the time, especially in congregations. How do we distribute our resources? God has given us gifts, abilities, talents. God has given us financial support. Are all of those things primarily, if not solely, for our members to enjoy? Are all of God's gifts and talents and our financial resources to be divided between our congregation and the outside community and ministering to those who do not belong in our, who do not belong to our congregation? Or other resources to be spent, the majority of them, on the outside community and mission, and what's left over is for our members. Now think about how God's people would answer that question and try to put it into a budget. That is a political discussion. With this definition and asking those kinds of questions, I've become convinced the Bible in general, Deuteronomy as a book in the Bible, and the Ten Commandments, as some would suggest, is a summation of the teachings of Deuteronomy. They are all political theologies. And so that's where we're going to begin, and that's what we're going to talk about. Now before we do that, I would like to share with you nine assumptions that I have made over the years. Because I think sharing these assumptions will help you better understand what I'm going to be saying over the next six weeks. The assumptions are these. The first assumption is the commandments in Deuteronomy and Exodus are essentially the same. Now I am sure someone out there is going to remind me that in the commandment you shall remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy that there are two reasons for keeping the Sabbath. One is in Deuteronomy, one is in Exodus. And they would be right. But when you take the whole discussion around it both of those books say remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy that is the primary teaching. And at the end of the day, God's people will have a Sabbath, and God's people will keep it holy. The second uh, assumption that I make is the commandments are not numbered. Now, now, that's not an assumption. But it's a very important observation, because in this idea that the the commandments are not ever numbered like first commandment, second commandment, third commandment in the scriptures. 
different church bodies number them for themselves. For example, Lutherans and Roman Catholics believe the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. And then in the next verse following the statement are the words, you shall not make graven images. In other words, you shall not have idols. Now Lutherans and Roman Catholics say, you shall not make graven images, you shall not have idols, is an explanation of you shall have no other gods before me. And therefore, those words do not lead to a separate commandment. On the other hand, Jewish people, the Orthodox churches in the East, the Reformed churches in the West, believe the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. And then the next verse, you shall not make graven images, in other words, have idols, is a separate commandment. And so we have one and two commandments. Now that affects the numbering throughout the rest of the commandments. I'm going to say to you, it doesn't matter. Every church body in the world has the same teachings. The numbering doesn't change the teachings. I'm always going to try to refer to the commandments not by a number, but by what the commandment is, so we don't get confused in the, in the discussions that we're going to have. <clears throat> the third assumption is the commandments are written on two tablets. Ah, that's in Scripture. The assumption is, tradition has it, the first tablet talks about our relationship with God and our spiritual life. And the second tablet talks about our relationships with other human beings. It has been said by several scholars that the second tablet is how you fulfill the command in Leviticus and Jesus' command in the Sermon on the Mount to love your neighbor. Here are concrete ways for God's people to love neighbor. I can't prove the tradition. It's not in Scripture. But I'm not going to challenge it either. My fourth assumption is the commandments are fluid. By that I mean when the historical context changes, often the commandments are expanded in one form or another, or there's a new interpretation. For example, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount expands the commandments, you shall not kill and you shall not commit adultery. Paul in his letters expand the commandment you shall not commit adultery to include fornication. The reformers of the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s expand the commandment, you shall honor your father and your mother, to include people who have some of the responsibilities of our biological parents, such as preachers, teachers, civil authorities such as mayors, princes, and even kings. Modern day biblical scholars and theologians wrestle with what does it mean not to have other gods when Christians are monotheists, meaning they believe in one God. So what does the commandment say in the 21st century when we're not to have other gods? And they define gods or deities differently than originally written. Now we're going to talk about all of these expansions and, and changes in interpretation in greater detail as we deal with each commandment. My fifth assumption is the commandments are countercultural. They will ruffle feathers. They, like the rest of the scripture, never support the status quo of our world. They are always calling us to be the image of God among the people we live. 
We are to be the light of the world. We are to be different. I'm aware that there are going to be those who say, no, 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 this isn't the way it is, but the commandments do not support the status quo. Therefore, they are countercultural. The commandments set boundaries. About two years ago, I read a book on theology in the 21st century, and the author described the role of theology as to be the foul lines on a baseball diamond. Inside the baseball diamond, you, we can discuss, we can debate, we can expand the theologies of the church. I'm thinking within the discussion of the Ten Commandments, inside the foul lines, we can discuss, we can expand, we can interpret differently each of the commandments, but we can't go outside of those foul lines. Therefore, the commandments set boundaries for all of God's people. The seventh assumption for the commandments is that they can be followed. There's a marvelous verse in the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy which says, to follow God's laws, ordinances, and statutes, we don't have to go to heaven. We don't have to go to other countries. We don't have to be super spiritual human beings. We don't have to perform miracles. Rather, God's laws, statutes, and ordinances, like the Ten Commandments, are written for daily life in this world by ordinary people living ordinary daily routines in a ordinary world. They can be followed as we live our daily life. They are not too difficult for us. The eighth assumption is when I use the words Israel, synagogue, congregation, or worldwide church, all of these words are synonyms one of the other. They all fit under the umbrella of God's people. And so therefore I'm going to use God's people and then occasionally or maybe more than occasionally use those other terms to represent God's people because it best fits what I'm trying to say. But when I say one, think of them all. And then finally, the ninth assumption, a nation, a congregation, any organization can be thought of as an individual. Because every nation, congregation, organization has its own values, attitudes, and lifestyles. It has its own traditions. It has its own little ways of doing things. And I maintain that every organization, congregation, nation has its quirks, which all of us know and help us to identify that group of people. What is said to a nation, what is said to a congregation, what is said to God's people can be said to all of the individuals who belong to God's people. So while I'm talking primarily, if not solely, to God's people as a collective body, what is being said can be easily transferred to individuals as well. Now before we turn off the cameras, before you go about what you need to do today and I go about what I need to do today, I want to raise four questions with you to keep this conversation going. And these are the four questions. Were there any surprises in the presentation? Did you know the Bible was written in two books? Did you know that the, definite, the reason for keeping the Sabbath day holy was different in Deuteronomy than in Exodus? Did you know the commandments were fluid? What were the surprises for you?
The second question is, were there any new insights? Did I say something somewhere, even if it was just a single sentence that said, that helps me understand a biblical text that I have been wrestling with? Or now I understand why Paul or Peter or one of the gospel writers wrote the way they did. Did it give me new understanding about how to read the Bible? Were there any insights for you? The third question is, were there any statements you want to challenge? You know, the response is, that's wrong. I don't believe it. Boy, if I'm going to take that seriously, I'm going to need to do a lot of praying and devotional work. What would you like to challenge over what I said? And finally, the fourth question, is there one thing you would want to tell someone about this presentation? If you had a conversation with a member of a Bible study that's not watching this video and, and somehow it came up in the conversation, what would be the one thing, and I mean one thing, that you would want to say about this presentation? Thank you for being a part of this first session in discussing the Ten Commandments as a political theology. I hope it was helpful, and I look forward to having you a part of the second presentation when we come together again. Have a good day.